Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome and welcome back for our returning delegates to uh, the Connect for Sound Learning Festival. Um, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar, looking at what it means to be a 21st century music education practitioner, which of course we all are. Um, I'm really delighted to see you all here this afternoon and I'm really, really looking forward to hearing from our panellists in this se session. I know they've got lots of exciting um, and very useful things to talk to us about. Before we start, I'll just describe myself. I'm a white woman in my early 40s with dark hair tied back in a black top and I'm sitting in front of a blue banner. So thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. I'm really hoping that you'll find this session both useful and enjoyable. And um, as always this week, I'm really um, enjoying and looking forward to getting together and talking to practitioners and professionals um, about what's been a really um, challenging and interesting year for, for this area of work. So in this session, we're going to be talking about the changing context for music teaching and working musicians, which has been a change which has been really accelerated this year. Um, and in particular, we're going to be talking about the sort of increase in technical skills and now that are now required to be um, a successful music education practitioner and looking at what sort of skills and technology um, are at our disposal. We're going to reflect a little bit on how educators have responded and adapted to the challenges posed by the pandemic. And we're also going to explore what people need to be aware of now in, in your working context and in keeping yourself safe and well looked after in your employed situation. And we're going to have a bit of future forecasting as well um, around this, this the theme of today, which is around the future of online music education. And thinking about in terms of the technical skills and developments and the more hybrid approach to teaching and working life, um, what's the future landscape going to look at? My colleague Laura's done the housekeeping very ably, so I won't go over that again, but do raise your hand or pop a question in the chat if you do have any questions. Um, and I'm just now going to introduce um, our panel for this afternoon. So I'm really delighted to welcome Jonathan Savage, David Barnard and Ben Redman. Jonathan's um, from You Can Play, who've done a lot of work in the area of music education and technology. David Barnard's from Musicians Union and Ben is a working musician and music educator who's also been undertaking doctoral research in the area of online music education and is going to tell us a little bit about that. We're going to hear from them in turn. Um, Jonathan, then David, then Ben, and then we're going to have um, a discussion amongst ourselves around some of the issues um, that are raised in the discussion. So I'm going to hand over now to Jonathan and hope that you all enjoy this afternoon's session. Thank you. Hello there, everyone. Hi. Thanks very much for the invitation, Emily. Um, really looking forward to today's webinar. Um, so just by way of an audio description, I'm um, in my early 50s. Um, I'm a, a man, obviously, and um, I'm sat in uh, in my son's bedroom, but I didn't think you'd like to see that. So I have I'm actually in front of a Damien Hurst rainbow made of butterfly wings, which is my backdrop for Zoom. Um, and I have a burgundy jumper on. Um, but I'm going to share my screen with everybody um, before I just start talking. So hopefully um, I can do that, Emily. Just uh, I've got an advanced option here. It says about sharing options. Um, I don't know if I'm meant to see that or not. Bear with me. There we go. That's working now. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Just going to play in there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend uh, a few minutes just reflecting on some of the technologies that we've been using during the Connect Resound project over the last seven years or so. Um, please try and move on and think a bit about how those technologies might be evolving in, in the future and also talk a bit about some of the skills um, associated with the use of these technologies. Um, many of these skills are things that we've been um, developing over the last few years in conjunction with NIMAS and the various partners that we've been working with. So um, I, I think that will take me about 15 minutes. So as you can see on your screen here, we've got a couple of images drawn from some live streaming work that we were doing a couple of weeks ago with uh, the Northern Chamber Orchestra up in Manchester. And live streaming, as we all know now, is, is a, has become a really 
um, useful way uh, in, in helping us share music and, uh, and our musical and other events um, online. And um, although we've been doing this for, for many, many years, of course, under the pandemic, it's become increasingly uh, popular. Within the Connect Resound project, um, particularly, we were talking about and exploring the streaming of live instrumental teaching. And uh, that's a context which I know you, you, many of you from the other sessions that I've been watching have been exploring as well. So in terms of the technologies that we've been using to underpin these things, um, really, they fall into three main categories, um, video equipment, audio equipment, and then the broadcast software that we use. So I just want to take each of those very quickly in turn. And all, all I've put together on my presentation are a few pictures of some of the uh, pieces of technology, just so that you can see them. And then just to remind me of the key things I wanted to talk about. So in terms of video technologies, first of all, and cameras, one of the key uh, principles of the Connect Resound project was that we were looking to explore the, the use of multiple cameras uh, to enhance the learning environment online. And um, when we started the project about eight years ago, um, we had some cameras that we were using from um, the CCTV uh, market uh, and they worked fine, uh, but they were quickly replaced by some more sophisticated cameras as we've moved along. And what you'll see on the screen here are, of course, some cameras um, which you will be, I'm sure, very familiar with, which can be used to provide you with um, a second camera if you're working in, in a home environment or an office environment. So you've got your computer or your laptop camera, which is built into your hardware. Um, and of course, if you want a second camera, then you can use something like um, a portable webcam at the top of the screen there or a digital camera on the left hand side at the bottom or even your mobile phone as a, an alternative camera source to provide you with a second perspective on you or your instrument or whatever it is that you're wanting to um, live stream. So um, we, we've explored those, um, particularly the, the webcam at the top there and the use of the mobile phone in various projects over the last couple of years. And as I say, you get a good two camera um, angled kind of approach to your live streaming by doing so. When you want to move into maybe a more sophisticated approach for live streaming with maybe four cameras, say, four different angles, then you need to do um, something a little bit different. And on this page, you'll see a couple of the cameras that we've been using in our live streaming work with NIMAS over the last year or so. So on the left hand side there as, as a standard um, Sony camcorder, um, about 150 pounds, something like that, um, which you can just buy in any you know, high street uh, retailer. Um, and on the right hand side, um, these are cameras that we've just uh, been um, exploring and using for our live streaming. These are um, professional uh, broadcast cameras by a company called Blackmagic, and they are significantly more expensive, um, but provide a lot more um, by way of affordances. So the cameras that we're using in these online um, educational um, experiences, whether that be in the from in, in streaming from a home environment or maybe looking at live streaming an event or um, from um, a school or a church or wherever it might be, are a really important part of the technology solution that you will need to consider. When you have multiple cameras for your live streaming, so more than two I'm talking about here, you need to have a piece of technology to mix together the um, cameras and to provide a stream and output of video. Um, images. And this is the unit that we've used within Connect Resound for the last four years or so. It's made by a company called Roland. And if you have a quick look at it, um, you'll see on the right hand side of this particular box, you have the um, cameras, um, uh, up to four cameras that you can mix together. And then on the left hand side, you have the audio mixer, which we'll come on to. And you can see that you can have six different microphones attached to this unit. What this unit does is it mixes together all of the audio and the video, and then it sends that to your computer um, in a single stream so that you can broadcast um, using um, your um, broadcast software, whatever that might be, whether it's Zoom or Teams or, or something else. Um, this is quite an expensive unit. It's more of a professional tool. Um, there are some more affordable little units, and this is one that we've just bought recently, which cost a few hundred pounds, this one, um, made by Blackmagic and it's um, called the ATEM Mini Pro, and it allows you to mix four cameras together 
um, and also mix an audio as well. So a very affordable solution for um, live streaming with multiple cameras, um, should you want to do that. So in terms of the video technologies, these are some of the things that we've been using and have found to be really productive. Moving on to the audio technologies, obviously here we're talking mainly about microphones. Oh, sorry, one more thing, um, should have mentioned this. Um, NIMAS have used this little device in a couple of projects recently, which is a really useful device. If you haven't got a computer handy and you want to use a, a, a small uh, mixer with uh, two mobile phones and a condenser microphone, this Roland Go Livecast is the solution. It allows you to use your mobile phone to stream um, and add in a second video angle from a second phone, which you connect wirelessly and also use a, a condenser, a better quality microphone as well. So I thought I'd mention that quickly. Moving on to microphones, um, we've used a range of microphones with our, our work with NIMAS. And uh, um, if, if you're wanting a, a basic microphone for, for, for use in the home environment or with your instrument, um, something like the PreSonus PX1, which costs about 95 pounds, is a really nice condenser microphone for, for that purpose. If you're wanting to do something with a, a musical group, so maybe a, you know, a small ensemble or a choir or something like that, which you're looking to live stream, then what you will need is a, is a pair of um, matched condenser microphones. And we've used the PreSonus PM2s for this. And again, about 95 pounds for this um, pair of microphones. And it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic solution at a, at a very good price point, in my opinion, for that sort of activity. And then finally, and, and these have come out in the last year or so, um, many manufacturers have begun to, to produce USB condenser microphones. Now these are, these are great because you can plug them directly into your computer. You don't need to use an audio interface with these. And uh, the Revelator microphone by PreSonus is one example. Again, a bit more expensive. It's about 115 pounds, something like that, um, but it's, allows you to, to have the benefits in terms of the sound quality of a condenser microphone um, without having to have a huge amount of investment into interfaces and things like that. So definitely something worth considering. Finally then, um, you need to broadcast and stream with software. Now we're all familiar, I'm sure by now with Zoom and Teams and other things like that. Um, within the Connect Resound project, we've used um, a whole range of different um, softwares to broadcast with. Um, we started using Skype um, about seven or eight years ago. Um, we've also used Google Hangouts and of course more recently um, Zoom and, and Teams as well. Um, but if you're looking to develop your skills in this area and, and try and do some more sophisticated types of live streaming then I would highly recommend you have a look at the Open Broadcaster software, OBS. You can see a screenshot of the software on, this, on my presentation here. And um, this provides you with the next level, if you like, in terms of um, functionality for live streaming. And it, this is what we use when we're doing um, events for NIMAS. So when we're going out and doing a live stream of an orchestra or a folk ensemble or jazz group or whatever it might be. And what it, I mean, really what it allows you to do is bring together different types of digital assets. So, um, you know, caption it, captioning or, photographic material or other video content, slides or um, uh, other bits of audio. Imagine, it, imagine it's like PowerPoint, I suppose, where you can bring together a lot of these things for a presentational purpose. It, it's the streaming equivalent of a PowerPoint environment. So I don't, I don't want to go through it in a lot, a lot of detail today. It's not the right occasion. But if you look at the bottom of the screen here, you'll see some um, different menus here, which one of which says sources and one of which mixer, and then you've got transition on the hand side over there. And what you can do with the Open Broadcaster software is prepare in advance your collection of content for your live stream. So that might be pieces of video or some um, text or photographs that you've, you've taken, etc. And you can then mix them live during the stream that you're doing um, and create a, you know, a nice professional kind of looking live stream. Now, um, that, that mixing functionality um, is one of the key features of this particular software. So if you imagine trying to do something similar within, you know, Zoom, 
it's a little bit more tricky and a little bit more um, difficult to, to, to manage. So it allows you to prepare a lot of that content in advance and then easily manage it during the live stream um, itself. Okay, I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen now. There we go. So hopefully you can um, see me now, not, not the screen. So those, that's a little bit of a, a, an insight into some of the technologies that we've been using over the last uh, few years with, with NIMAS as, as the technical partner for um, Connect Resound. Now, in terms of where these technologies are going, um, it's, it's been a really interesting kind of process. And, and, and obviously, looking ahead, it's difficult sometimes to work out exactly what's going to happen. But I would anticipate that many of these technologies would continue in some way, shape or form. Um, hopefully some of the prices associated with some of these technologies will come down a little bit and the functionality will increase. But there is a broad range of options for, for live streaming using the, uh, the video, audio and broadcast solutions that we've um, present, I've presented this afternoon. In terms of what we're thinking about, we're, we're definitely looking at ways in which um, we can promote um, a, a kind of richer pedagogy with these tools. I think that's where our main, main focus has, has always been. Um, and it, it goes right back to the beginning of Connect Resound when we were working with the University of Hull and we were exploring the functionality and the potential benefits of a multi-camera environment for teaching and learning in music. And um, we were just chatting beforehand about how, how you know it's so important not to get distracted by the technologies themselves, but to really think hard about what you're doing with the technology and why you're doing it. Um, and to make sure it underpins a really rich and musical approach to the teaching of music. Um, so I think for us, it's, it's very much about um, teachers' creativity with the technology, about you know, using it for the right purposes. Um, we've certainly um, learnt in terms of skills an, an awful lot over the last few years, and we're continuing to learn. And uh, in terms of specific um, skills, I think one of the things I've learned or, or um, continuing to learn is around the importance of um, specific technical skills about each of the elements of live streaming. It's very easy in one sense just to get everything kind of working, but actually there are kind of key subsets of skills within specific areas that, that, that it's worth considering if you're looking to improve the quality of what you're doing um, in terms of the technical um, aspects and, and pedagogical aspects as well. I mean, one, one, of the, one of the things which I will just um, mention, it's, it's very kind of obvious, I suppose, is that um, the quality of the lighting that you might have in a space is absolutely crucial to the quality of the live stream that you produce. Um, so, you know, just, just simple things like making sure that you're not sat with a window behind you, you know, in a home environment is going to be, you know, make a huge difference to the quality of the image that people see. If you're live streaming in a, in, a, in a school hall or in a church or whatever it might be, you know, the quality of the, the lighting that's in that space um, can make a huge difference to how it's perceived in, in, on a screen somewhere. So, um, you know, it's, it's about the technical skills in terms of positioning lights in the right places and making sure that, that you know, that's managed well or, or, or the mix of lights if you've got that opportunity to use, a, use um, different types of lighting in, in, a, in a live event. Um, in terms of our, um, our, our future work, we're looking at various different ways in which these technologies can be used to help promote live streaming and make it more accessible to people. Um, at the moment, we're sending teams of people out across the country to do live streaming for educational clients, and that's, and that's fine, and, and we'll carry on doing that. But we're looking at technical solutions to manage live streaming uh, remotely using internet protocols um, for the handling of video and audio. And we're hoping to um, promote or develop that work over the next year. Um, so essentially what we would then be able to do is offer a live streaming service to a small school where they poten potentially hire the equipment for, for a few days and we provide mentoring support and then technical support remotely. Um, and then we can manage the live stream remotely as well and that we would hope would significantly bring down um, the cost of that service to a school or music hub service etc and the final point I just wanted to make and it's more of a pedagogical point I think rather than a technical point is that 
I've been really impressed with the the quality of the presentations during the festival this week and I've just constantly um, inspired by the way that teachers have been working in these environments over the last year or so. Uh, one of the things I did notice, which I, I, I would agree with, is that um, live streaming in terms of tuition can often be matched by and integrated with um, asynchronous kind of materials, pre-recorded materials or pre-recorded content. And I think the maybe one of the areas where we can develop our work as music teachers online is to really think about, think hard about which aspects of the musical learning that we're wanting our children to engage with. Can we um, facilitate through um, pre-recorded content and what, what's, what's, what can be done live online? What's so important that it needs to be done in a live environment? Um, and then how can those two um, two different ways of delivering content asynchronously or synchronously, how can they blend together to create the optimal environment for um, musical learning in our uh, particular area. So um, I hope you found that a useful kind of overview of some of the technologies and skills that we've been exploring during Connect Resound and where some of the future um, might be heading. And I've used my time, so I'm going to hand back to Emily. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan, and thank you so much for keeping to time. You can tell you're an experienced music educator there, knowing how long 20 minutes is. <laughs> a definite music education skill. That was a really useful walk through um, some of the hardware that's available and software that's available to us to create really professional solutions for live streaming and online teaching. So thank you very much. And thank you for thinking about all the different contexts in which music educators use this technology as well. And as you say, how we can use the technology in the service of really good teaching and really good learning experiences, which is, is ultimately the reason we use it. And I think you're right. I think a theme that's come all the way through this week is that challenge now of, of, of what a really good hybrid offer looks like. So what needs to be live in, in person, if possible? What needs to be resources that are available on demand? and what works really well as, a, as an online offer um, and helps to create better access and participation for, for people through, through online. So thank you for that. Um, I'm now really happy to hand over to our second speaker, David Barnard, who's from the Musicians' Union. And, and I've asked you to think, David, about what, what you think the, the sort of landscape for in, in terms of our sort of employment context as, as music educators is going to look like um, in the 21st century and what sort of things are coming up for your members now? Okay, okay, thank you very much. I shall do likewise and share a PowerPoint with everybody. Um, I'm assuming you can hear me okay. Um, so, um, by means of introduction, uh, I'm, a, I'm a trombonist, I'm a teacher, I was a former head of music service, uh, university lecturer, as an examiner for the Guildhall, uh, and the course leader for the CT ABRSM, and, and then I kind of stepped into the dark side for uh, 10 years and worked as head of education for Roland, which was a company Jonathan mentioned not long ago, um, and now I'm um, the education officer uh, for the Musicians' Union and uh, in my spare time, Chair of Resonance, a new uh, higher education provider in the West Midlands. Uh, for those of you who can't see me, uh, I'm white, I'm in my 50s and in a very untidy office. Um, so um, I, I want to quote Monty Python here because um, uh, it, it, in, my, in, in some ways my presentation is now for something completely different, which, which is all about uh, some of the employment issues that we at the MU have been dealing with, uh, and there have been several uh, that have come about as a result of COVID. Um, so if you're not aware of who the Musicians' Union are, we, we work on uh, protecting employment rights, and uh, working conditions. Uh, we do a lot of work in supporting education. We have a dedicated education team. Uh, we uh, fight every day in opposing uh, forms of harassment, prejudice and unfair discrimination. And we are regularly lobbying the government at all levels uh, to protect the rights of musicians, educators, etc. cetera. Um, we're an organization with 32,000 members and, and you know, size does matter because with that volume of membership, uh, the government and others do sit up and listen 
to what we have to say. So um, let's talk a bit about the impact of COVID. Uh, um, we all know that it's affected us professionally and also privately. You know, I'm still learning to cut my own hair, um, which, uh, as you can see, I'm feigning at the moment. But it, it has had an enormous impact. And, and I do a little bit of teaching, and I've had to do that all online. So I'm really fascinated by what Jonathan has proposed in terms of technological solutions and looking forward to, to what Ben has to say. I, I at first resisted online teaching, thinking it wasn't going to be as good as the real thing, but actually I've really come to enjoy it now. Uh, and so so do my pupils. And, and I have seen real progress. Um, it's a different approach um, and it requires a different preparation, but uh, I, I am going to embrace this going forward and have a blend of in-person and online teaching. Indeed, I've actually now got two pupils in Hong Kong, which is really fascinating. Um, so yeah, the, the music industry has suffered enormously from COVID. Um, and I know that a great deal of music teachers have, have, have faced a number of challenges, but also new opportunities. But from what we have seen, it has also revealed some systemic weaknesses. Um, and it's not over yet. Um, yesterday, I had to cancel uh, an evening an event this evening because of resurgence of the Indian variant of COVID. And so we, 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 we're not over this yet. Um, and what I'm presenting today in many ways is, is a call to action. Um, if you've not thought of contracts, etc., now is your time to do so. And hopefully what I'll uh, share with you today uh, will motivate you to do that. Um, so in terms of employment, it's been fascinating when we've been contacted by members. How many members um, are working in a school's context or in a hub or in a private school and haven't got a contract? So when you, our first question, when somebody contacts us and says, I'm concerned about my employment situation, our first question is, well, what kind of contract have you got? And in many cases, I think nearly 80% of our inquiries so far, people have said, we don't have a contract. So therefore, that leads on to confusion in terms of whether you're employed, and we all know that when you're employed, you have certain benefits, or whether you're self-employed, or whether you're somewhere in the middle uh, in, in what's called worker status. And of course, this, uh, in terms of COVID, this has led to questions, well, do I qualify for furlough, furlough or, or do I qualify for the self-employment income support scheme? And it also has raised issues in, in terms of the right to access pupils. And um, if you are genuinely self-employed, you are in business for yourself. And so if you are working for an organization that says you do not have access to your pupils, then it begs the question, are you genuinely self-employed? The other thing that's come out of our experience over the last year is that, and this is particularly in private practice uh, or where people are self-employed, is that very few seem to have terms and conditions in place. But that's essentially is about understanding the, your rights as a supplier of a service, but also the expectations from the customer's point of view. And that's really important to do. And I, I know from my own private teaching that where I haven't had terms and conditions, it really does rely on goodwill. But there are times when you need to rely on a contract just to protect yourself. And certainly we've seen uh, where there is an absence in terms of conditions, demands for a reduction in fees. The perception being that online teaching is of a, an inferior quality to the real one-to-one -one teaching. When in fact, I know that both Jonathan and Ben will argue that no, the quality of teaching is still there. You know, it's still very high and therefore it justifies maintaining the fees. There's also issues regarding copyright uh, the use of copyright materials and intellectual property. As soon as you start sharing those online, you know, then then you, you open yourself up to to challenges unless you've protected yourself. So um, a lot of people now who are contacting us um, are now beginning to think about their contractual agreements. And again, this is where the MU can come in and help. Safeguarding. A, one of the first things that we noticed from the MU's point of view was a, a sense of panic with regards to self-safeguarding. And in many cases, it resulted in 
a lot of schools telling their teachers that you cannot teach online for safeguarding reasons. And this revealed a, a complete lack of guidance, policy and procedure. And I think the word panic is quite a good one here because that's what we did sense. Um, and we've, we've spent a great deal of time producing our materials that help teachers prepare them, themselves for online uh, learning, um, but also provide reassurance to parents and to the schools that you're not as a teacher going to be recording your lessons and posting up on YouTube, you know, things like that. Things that we might, for those of you who are used to online teaching, would seem as common sense. Um, so uh, if you need some guidance on uh, safeguarding for online teaching, have a look at the MU's website. Uh, the other fact which is really fascinating and something which um, we saw where data was being freely shared between uh, employers and so-called self-employed teachers was a complete lack of compliance with GDPR, which for those of you who don't know is about data protection. And again, this revealed certain weaknesses in terms of an understanding, uh, training and, and, and general compliance. So those of you who are in private practice and are keeping and maintaining a database of your students, I would strongly recommend that you visit the Information Commissioner's office. And there is a, a questionnaire there that you can complete, um, which uh, helps you to understand whether you should be a member of or registered with the ICO or not. Our advice is um, perhaps you should be registered if you are a self-employed teacher. Now, you know, when you are in a crisis, as we have been through, and it's not over, there is no better time to be in the MU. Now, this is not me trying to do a sales pitch, but it really means that, you know, that you've got somebody, an organisation that can support you. Now, uh, those of you who have not been to the MU's website, if you have a look under the uh, top tab, working and performing, and then there's a secondary tab, music teaching, you'll see uh, a free resources that you can you can look at and read and download about on a variety of topics such as teaching during covid employment status health and safety which includes doing a risk assessment because a lot of teachers who are going into schools now are being asked to do a risk assessment um, but also you as a teacher going into a school should have all you should have access to the school's risk assessment so that you know that you're safe uh, but there's guidance about teaching online um, safeguarding contracts and more but if you um, you can actually join the MU for as little as a pound for the first six months and then uh, we also offer joint membership at the NEU and the National Education Union the equivalent in Scotland called the EIS or the uh, U, uh, UCU um, there are obvious great benefits but the reason why I think it's important to be part of an organization like this is that you are part of a movement that is protecting the entire industry and also the rights of teachers. Um, if you are concerned about your employment status and if uh, COVID has brought up questions where you are unsure whether you're employed or self-employed or otherwise, uh, you can um, uh, contact me uh, on my email address I've just written a book called uh, The Guide to Employment Status, which hopefully takes you through all of those key elements. And you're very welcome to that uh, free of charge. So um, that's my little bit of uh, now for something completely different. Um, it's not as exciting as technology, but it's absolutely crucial that you look after yourself in terms of contract and your terms and conditions. OK, so I'll hand you back. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. I absolutely agree about how crucial all the issues you've raised in that presentation are. And, and you know, that's why we wanted to program this as, as part of this session. Yes, we're looking at technology, we're looking at latency, we're looking at all sorts of exciting things around teaching, but fundamentally, we've had such a rush to teaching online for obvious reasons this year. And all of these things just, you know, people had to had to just start doing it without being able to get across all of these things around safeguarding and GDPR and not knowing where to go to. So thank you to you and your colleagues at the Musicians Union for, for having our back as a sector and, and supporting us in that way. And I think as a whole, we've we've been doing a lot of thinking about 
as, a, as, a, as an art sector, we are so reliant on the freelance workforce and when all of a sudden that whole workforce loses its job overnight, what is the responsibility of that sector to that workforce where there isn't that contractual relationship? And it's it has been really brought into focus this year. So that's that's great to great to be thinking about. Thank you. Um, I'm, I was really delighted to hear from um, Benjamin Redman in the in the lead up to this um, conference because Benjamin, Ben's been doing a lot of research over the last year, really going into depth about the teaching and learning experience of online tuition, um, thinking and talking to people about what that's been like, what the pedagogical experience has been like and all of those things, but also I know has um, done a lot of thinking about what's next and, and, and technologies like sort of low latency software, which I know from my discussions with music education is after the after, over the last eight years is, is always the first thing that people ask. So Ben, I'd, I'd really like to hear more about your research and um, thank you for being with us this afternoon. Oh, thanks Emily and thanks uh, to the team. And uh, thanks also to Jonathan David for fascinating uh, talks there. So I'm gonna attempt to share my screen here and Hopefully that's working okay. Um, perhaps someone can say if it isn't and I'll just carry on. So, um, thanks Emily. So this presentation is partly based on my research into video conferencing and low latency technologies such as Lola and Jack Trip, and also my experience as a teacher during the pandemic. So I've been using video conferencing both as a learner and a teacher since 2008. And prior to the pandemic, when discussing video conferencing with colleagues, uh, I found it to be quite an emotive subject. So colleagues have said things like, well, you can't teach via video conferencing. It will put us all out of a job. Or if I have to teach like that, I'm resigning. Um, <laughs> and a teacher at a university um, in the UK told me that um, they were using video conferencing to remain in contact with their students while they were away on tour and their colleagues got wind of this and went to the management at the university and said we're not happy and the teacher was asked to stop teaching that way so that's just to give a bit of context there quite an emotive subject um so um yeah as i said i'm going to be talking about the the low latency technologies and also discussing a little bit about latency itself so thinking about teaching via video conferencing, so it does necess necessitate a change of teaching style. So lessons require more planning to ensure materials are shared in advance or ready to be sent during lessons. There's a different type of exchange. Uh, the teacher needs to be very clear and precise with their instructions and frequently checking with students to check that they've understood. It's quite an intense experience as well. Um, it requires hyper-focus and because um, one has to be slightly more aware of things than in the perhaps in the face-to-face -face environment and it can be very tiring as I'm sure all of us have found <laughs> certainly in the last year and I think the the term zoom fatigue has crept into the lexicon um, so there's a social as well as a physical disconnect and um, it's a lot of teachers have expressed concerns about diagnosing physical problems remotely also a concern about audio quality, uh, not getting a true representation of the pupil sound. Many factors contribute to um, variation in the quality of the experience. So the type of platform, um, I remember starting off on Skype um, many, many years ago, and it was so bad that I probably wouldn't even recognize some of the people if I passed them in the street because the picture quality was that bad. However, it served a purpose and it was functional and I think Certainly when we had the, the pivot um, to online teaching back in March last year, I was actually pleasantly surprised how well Microsoft Teams worked, never having used it myself before previously, um, because I just had so many bad experiences with other platforms. Um, so that's one of the factors, um, quality and stability of the network. I've got a um, direct line from my router into my laptop because I know that can certainly improve things. We'll speak a bit about that later. Quality of the equipment being used. Um, you know, Jonathan spoke um, about different types of microphones, all really interesting stuff. 
Um, technical support for students. Um, it's been really nice to actually to have parents in the background just helping their uh, kids just get things set up. So that makes a big difference. Um, and also the environment that the, the student finds himself in is mum trying to do a video call with, for work in another room, things like that. So there's many more factors, but um, I'm going to go on for now. So what do we lose when we're teaching via video conferencing? Well, obviously, teacher can't physically walk around the student and observe from different positions. They can't adjust the instrument or adjust the student's posture. Can't write on the score and the biggie. They can't play together. However, I'm sure we all know instances where you know we've managed to solve some of these problems ourselves, and many teachers are using um, their creativity and coming up with imaginative solutions. So other things that have come out perhaps more specifically while um, we've been confronted with COVID. So certainly I found it took me a while to get up to speed with creating new digital resources. And I know a lot of other teachers have found exactly the same experience. Some good things, um, students are becoming more collaborative and they engaging in peer learning. So for example, students sharing um, a, a sound file and asking another student to add to it. And so they're creating new pieces collaboratively. Students becoming more resourceful in how they solve technical problems. However, there are um, clearly problems with the digital divide and um, not all students have access um, or equitable access. Um, they may not have very good internet. I certainly lost some students um, due to them not having internet. However, I think equally as big a part as the actual lack of technical resources, there was also the sheer stress and overwhelm that a lot of students found during um, the past year, as indeed we all have. Um, so that, I think, contributed to some students dropping out. Um, students losing accountability for their work and practice. Um, from the teaching side, certainly a wish for improved internet connections would reduce latency. We all miss playing together. Um, however, there's a really good opportunity here to change the way we teach. And certainly I've been I'm fascinated to discuss this with colleagues. Um, so. Certainly there's more demanded of us as musicians now. And my thinking is that students um, need to not just be consumers of digital uh, content, but we also need to help them to find ways to become creators themselves. Now, of course, many young people are YouTubers and they and, and use platforms like TikTok to upload um, videos and what have you. So, you know, a lot of kids actually are on board with that but I think something that we could certainly um, be doing as educators is thinking about how we we build on this so there are of course some benefits um, to teaching online um, certainly brass teacher colleagues say that they've actually having got over the initial shock of it they've actually quite enjoyed being able to teach remotely because it's helping with problems such as tinnitus um, being in a enclosed a smaller enclosed space with lots of of brass um, pupils, um, yeah, that, that's that's been something they've found useful. Um, ability to make in-lesson video recordings with appropriate um, provision for safeguarding and so on. Um, being able to use multiple camera angles, as Jonathan was talking about, to see um, different um, positions, say close up of embouchures, that type of things. Um, but overwhelmingly, teachers have expressed concerns that students should also be exposed to a full range of rehearsal and performing experiences with other musicians. So um, thinking about the latency itself. So latency refers to the time it takes for one performer's sound to reach the other performer's ears. So it's typically measured in milliseconds and sound travels at approximately one foot per millisecond through air. Um, synchronized music typically requires um, a latency below 25 to 30 milliseconds in one direction, anything over that. And there's just this dog chasing its tail effect. And usually um, a performance can can fall apart. There are ways to mitigate this 
simply we just decide well, one person's the leader and um, they mute the other side and then the other person just plays along. So that's one way. But um, yeah, it's certainly a, a, an issue. And we're going to come on to that in a little while. There's a sweet spot at about 11.5 milliseconds. But the thing is that this concept of latency and delay, um, experienced musicians, um, I mean, I'm a percussionist. I've worked in, for example, freelance with the BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra, big distance between the percussion section and the, con and the conductor. Um, done a whole variety of other types of work, you know, in, in big arenas and so on. And so, you know, we just get used to kind of almost blocking out some sounds and just focusing e either on the conductor or just getting used to that. So it's something that can be developed. Um, but anyway, it's just things to, to take into consideration. Now, of course, we can just decide to embrace the latency. <laughs> and uh, Sarah Weaver is a, a New York based um, network music um, artist, uh, performer, composer. I did an interview with her quite recently and she was explaining about how they've used one of the technologies we're going to come on to, Jack Trip, um, in network music performance. And they use music which she terms non-steady beat and she'll use compositional techniques like polyphony and use different textures say for example have a drone call and response so these are all different techniques which can be used um, to still make music together collaboratively over the internet or indeed in face-to-face in -face environments also um, i read recently a vocal teacher explained that they'd actually found the the latency to be quite helpful in um, in vocal training to teach a technique known as back phrasing where the singer will just sing slightly behind the beat and then catch up just at the end so there are things that we can do um, so factors that affect the latency over the internet so clearly the distance between performers um, so data travels over a fiber optic cable at about 70 percent of the speed of light um, other things that affect are segments um, in the network and relay points called network hops so the greater the distance and the greater the number of hops the longer a sound will take to get from source to destination good latencies are achievable where musicians are physically located within a several hundred mile radius um, also depends on the type of connection with fiber to the home being the fastest about two milliseconds cable or dsl which is digital subscriber line being slowest at about 10 to 15 milliseconds so bandwidth um, for home networks um, the bandwidth specifies how much data can be transmitted over a given period of time um, however having a high bandwidth rate even one gigabit um, may not necessarily correspond to having low latency so the home network even the best Wi-Fi routers add significant latency. And as I've already said, I've actually got an, an Ethernet cable plugged into my laptop. Then other factors are the analog to digital conversion and conversely, the digital to analog con conversion. So um, that's to do with sound cards and um, different sound cards have different amounts of latency. Um, laptops can easily have latencies over 100 milliseconds and so that's something as then we're going to be going on to to think about is how this affects what we do with different types of, of software so the best way to reduce um, latency is to use a hardware device which is um, specifically designed for minimal latency finally there's the acoustic latency between the for me speaking into my um, microphone and then the sound coming from your end from your computer through the speakers and reaching your ears unless you're using headphones of course so all these different aspects add up to to latency we're now going to look at um, different types of internet connection so the first one is the um, client server model also known as hub and spoke so in this model um, every performer's computer sends a single copy of their audio to a central server or the hub the server mixes all the audio streams together and sends a single copy of the mix back to every performer's computer which plays it to their audio output 
So the pros here are that there's no change required in the performer's home internet firewalls, except in rare circumstances. There's minimal processing and bandwidth requirements for the performer's computers. Um, cons are it requires configuration and management of a central hub server. Also adds latency through an additional stage in the audio path. The next model is the peer-to-peer -peer model. And in this model, each performer's computer sends a copy of their audio input directly to um, every other performer. So each performer's computer mixes all the incoming audio streams together and plays the result to their audio output. So pros are that it doesn't require a central server and it achieves the lowest latency. Cons are that there's high processing requirements for each performer's computer. Um, there's high upload and download bandwidth requirements, and um, there's also requires to be changes in many of the performer's internet firewalls. So now thinking about um, factors that affect our choice of which system to adopt. So expense, usability, accessibility. So how easy is it to get to use the equipment? When we're speaking about Lola, um, that wasn't accessible to users over the last, well, certainly the early stages of the pandemic because it was situ it has to be situated in an institution. So that was obviously an issue there. So reliability, if the technology isn't reliable, no one wants to use it. And then also the attitude surrounding it. If management of an institution don't see the point in having it or the technologists in there, you're going to have real problems with that. I have found to my cost. So thinking about Lola itself then, so what is Lola? So it's low latency, which is where the Lola bit comes from, high quality audio visual transmission system for network musical performances. And it enables real time music performance. So this is a major technological leap forward. However, um, it's been around for some time. Uh, the tech requirements are that it's um, you need a dedicated PC with graphics and sound card. The software itself is free to use for academic and educational use. Also requires um, specific hardware, very fast camera and high speed monitors. And it does need a fast and stable network. Um, OK, so it's developed at the um, Conservatorio de Musica Giuseppe Tartini in Trieste in 2005 and was then developed um, over the next few years. And the first public demonstration took place in 2010. So it was a piano duet performance um, with one performer in Trieste and the other in Paris at a distance of approximately 1300 kilometers apart. Um, Think about Lola in education then. So um, what can we use it for? So obviously teaching and one to one group or master classes can be used for trial and consultation lessons. So, for example, students um, going on Erasmus exchange can have a lesson with a professor or teacher in a different institution, see if they're going to gel first um, use for rehearsals. Um, and this is, I think, a really exciting opportunity here because um, as I've already said, I'm a percussionist and um, maybe I want to rehearse with other percussionists, um, but there's a lack of instruments. So, for example, um, thinking about marimbas, um, many years ago, I traveled to New York to play in a in a marimba orchestra. There was 150 marimbas. Now, clearly, that's you know beyond the scope of, of any institution to have that many um, in one place because you need a very, very big hall. Um, and actually, when I came back from New York, one of my colleagues said, oh, 150 marimbas, that would make a nice bonfire. But anyway, let's not go there. Um, so, th you know, having Lola to connect different um, institutions up could really facilitate some new types of performance. I think it's really exciting. Um, recording possibilities um, also so that's remote recording possibilities. Um, exam students, um, we I analysed some data from a European project um, under the auspices of the Association of European Conservatoires. And um, some students said that they'd actually be very happy to do exams via Lola because there's a slight disconnect between um, them in their institution and um, teachers in a different institution. And they may actually feel more comfortable with that. 
auditions as well, although that would have to take place between specific auditions, but maybe if it was a student in, in an undergraduate programme in one institution wanting to audition for a master's or DPERF um, programme in a different institution, Lola would work really nicely for that. Okay, um, so thinking about um, teaching again, I've already um, discussed a lot of these things. This picture here um, is from a, a demonstration that we ran at the Royal Conservatoire um, back in 2019 um, with Professor Alan Neve, who's the head of guitar and harp. And um, Alan was teaching two different students at Edinburgh Napier University, which is actually one of our partner institutions. And um, crucially, Alan was able to play at the same time as the students and to give real time commentary and feedback while they were playing. So um, from through my research, I found that um, playing together with students is frequently used in face to face lessons. And therefore, Lola can more closely match the performance of face to face lessons than standard video conferencing platforms. But Alan still said that he would definitely prefer to um, play and work with students in the face-to-face -face setting. However, this was interesting and useful and, and it was certainly better than um, than standard video conferencing. So for recording sessions, I observed some um, sessions between Edinburgh Napier and the Royal College of Music and also um, Boston, um, well the Berkeley College of Music in, in Boston in, in America. So at that distance there was quite a lot of latency, it was about 80 to 100 milliseconds which did cause some problems. They solved it by one person saying or at one side saying okay we're going to mute you guys and um, we'll just play and they followed. So there are ways around this and um, it turned into a really interesting project. New performance opportunities. Um, this was um, a still from a performance I um, was in the audience for in Copenhagen at the Royal Danish Academy of Music, um, longing for the impossible. It was mind blowing. Um, there were musicians and dancers in the studio live in Copenhagen, mixed with musicians in London and also dancers in Barcelona. So it was absolutely fascinating. I will say this though, there were quite a lot of worried faces with the tech guys um, right up to the moment when the performance um, was going to start. So <laughs> yeah, there was a lot, yeah, that that's something we'll, we'll talk about in a moment. So barriers to using Lola's. Obvious question, if it's so great, why isn't everybody using it? Well, there's an expense up front of requisition of the equipment plus it needs to be stored somewhere and maintained. That was an issue for us at the Royal Conservatoire. Um, then there's the, well, OK, who's going to set it up? And a lot of teachers said, well, they weren't too confident with doing that, understandably. Um, I have to say it's actually no more difficult to use once it's all set up than just logging into a video call. But it's getting over that initial um, tech fear, I guess, um, then you need network assistance to work around institution firewalls. That is a major issue. There also needs to be a critical mass of institutions using it. So this, as you probably guessed now, this uses a peer to peer network model um, as opposed to Jack Trip, which we're now going to speak about, which actually uses um, the client server or hub and spoke model. So Jack Trips um, Low latency, high quality audio, but it is audio only. So it needs to be used if you want to have the video element. It's used um, in parallel with, well, with any, you, you take your pick. I've used it in parallel with Zoom um, for a teaching trial. It worked really nicely, but clearly the audio and the video weren't in sync. So we needed to sort of work around that. It is raw and uncompressed audio, which can then be shaped. And the really exciting thing with JackTrip is as of the last year, it works on um, standard networks. And it it was originally developed by Chris Chafe and his team at Stanford University in Karma, uh, which is the computer, um, the Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics. And in the last year, um, they realized, OK, you know, we can really do something with this. So um, in its original format, I tried to use it without any success, I have to say, um, because it uses command line. You can it's free to, to download software that works on major platforms, Linux, 
um, Mac operating system and Windows. But as you can see, it's a little bit intimidating this um, this user interface. So they've actually since come up with standalone units, which are pretty inexpensive. It can be downloaded for free onto a Raspberry Pi device, one of the small, um, sort of, yeah, basic, very, very no frills um, computer. Um, and Raspberry Pi is about £70 or so. You will need to have additional peripherals such as a plug-in microphone and an audio out, um, either speakers or headphones. Um, the Jack Trip Foundation have developed um, what they call their Virtual Studio product. And um, this was used with great success by the Ragazzi Boys Chorus in Silicon Valley in the States. So this led to a performance um, in December of last year for 53 boys and from all remotely from their homes using a standard network and um, using these very inexpensive devices all play or singing together synchronously wow really really exciting i think um, so there are other um, types of software available um, jam kazam jamulus are just two that spring to mind i have to say i've tried without success to use um, jam kazam um, and it just got frustrating in the end. We got it to the stage, me and a pal, um, we got it to the stage where we could almost connect, but we couldn't quite, and it was just a very frustrating session. And we said, oh yeah, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll try again next weekend, maybe. It still hasn't happened. So this comes back to when we're deciding which um, type of system, low latency system to use. Again, refer back to these five points and the expense of it. Um, usability, accessibility, reliability, and the attitudes that go around it from, say, administrators and um, just users in general. So, um, thinking about possible future um, developments, um, this photo is from um, 2018, whereas Misha Dola is a professor in wireless communications at King's College London. Um, he performed um, a live concert with his daughter over a 5G video link. Um, she sang from London's Guild Hall and he was in Berlin. And so it's like over a thousand kilometers away with an end to end delay of just 20 milliseconds, which is just within our sort of performance threshold there. Um, virtual reality, augmented reality, people that I think are somewhat exhausted um, and disillusioned with VR um, just now, but it may come into its own again. Im interesting implications as to um, as it allows us to, to assume the perspective of someone else. Haptic technologies so um, might allow remote parties to feel similar physical sensations. The 5G network may do away with the need for cable. And then finally, quantum communication. So that's Einstein's spooky interaction at a distance. This potentially um, transcends the speed of light. We're not quite there with quantum computing yet, but it's um, it's on the horizon for sure. So that that's a really exciting possibility. So thank you very much for listening. And um, that's my email address. Um, I'd be very, very happy to um, to hear from anybody who wants further information. And um, I'm just at the final write up stage of my doctoral thesis and I'm really excited to get this thing knocked out now. Um, but there's still little bits of data coming in just to add to it. So, um, yeah, I'm really happy to speak to anybody who has any questions. And thank you once again. So I will stop sharing now. Thank you so much. So many exciting things on the horizon. Um, it's It was wonderful to have such a granular description, first of all, of what the teaching and learning experience was like in, in the first part of your research. And just amazing to look at the performance and rehearsal um, technologies that are taking place at the sort of higher education and professional level at the moment, but give us a bit of a window into what might be possible for all of us, not too far down the line. So thank you so much for that. Um, and yeah, brilliant. we've heard from Jamulus a little earlier um, in the week from um, the uh, Irish Association of Youth Orchestras and how they've been using that. So it's great to hear about Jack Trip as well and get those comparisons about what's what works over audio. Because I think we've we've seen we can sort of mix and match different technologies at the same time and it doesn't so much matter 
if you've not got the visuals synced up, if you've got the audio synced up somewhere else. I think we've all we've all done enough to sort of work around things like that. So really exciting. Um, quantum communication. I, I don't think I'm even going to start to attempt what that's about. <laughs> yet so I'll, I'll let you come back in future years and explain that to us otherwise I think my head's going to explode um, thank you all so much um, for giving us a window on all things technological software, pedagogical and also just our environment as music educators and, and the, the, the legal and, and systemic sort of uh, context that we're all working in, that's, that's been a fascinating session um, I'm opening it up to questions now. I can see we've got um, a couple of questions that have come in already and please do put up your hands or pop a question in the Q&A if you do have a question. Um, so we've got a comment from Alan Cameron um, who says hello Ben and uh, he, he worked with colleagues in the Royal uh, Conservatory of Scotland in 2010 delivering brass video conference lessons to Dumfries and Galloway. So I think all of you in Scotland have been way ahead of the curve with, with a lot of this online teaching. So that's that's great. Um, well, another question that's come in, um, which I think is um, relevant to, to all three of you, really, which is we know there's, there's barriers and concerns around cost, particularly for those of us who are freelance practitioners, um, sort of thinking, well, what is it that we, we could and should invest in now, whether it's skills or hardware um, or training? Um, and in terms of equipment, you might invest in equipment that might be cutting edge now, but is it going to still work in a, a year or so's time? So I suppose I'd ask each of you really to share any insight on on the realities of hardware needing updating over time and, and also kind of funding and business planning to deal with those costs now that we know we're working in that sort of more hybrid area of delivery. So I'll just ask you to give any reflections in turn, Jonathan, then Ben, then David, if that's all right, because that's how you appear on my screen. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have a go first of all. I mean, if, if you're a private individual, rather than working for an institution then then clearly you know you're, you're having to kind of fund things yourself it's it's it is an investment isn't it and you know there's no getting away from that there are you know a range of free software environments um i mean ben mentioned one there jam kazam which you know we've done some work with o over over time and we've, we've written some resources for um which you know it is tricky to set up but it can it can help you know um and I mentioned Open Broadcaster, and you know, um, you know, as a, as a software platform, Google Hangouts is another one. You know, you don't have to be buying a Zoom subscription. Um, you know, there are other options available there. Um, I think you know, my tip would be to try and choose pieces of technology that do more than one thing, um, and you can use in different ways. Um, so, I mean, for for instance, you know, that 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 USB condenser microphone that I talked about, you know. Um, it's only slightly more than a conventional condenser microphone, but it saves you having to buy an audio interface. Um, you can manage it in software, which comes free with the product. You, you also get actually with um, any hardware piece from PreSonus, you also get a free software license for their um, Studio One um, DAW, which is a really, really good uh, DAW piece of software. So, you you know, you won't be having to buy, you know, Cubase or whatever the logic or whatever the you know mac equivalents are so you know there are some there are companies out there that are trying really hard to make quality products um at a very very accessible price point now you might not think 115 pounds is accessible um but it, it that is a very you know a very good price for um what is a very good quality microphone um now clearly it's not a three thousand pound microphone um, so it would be silly to think it's going to be of that level, but you don't need that a three thousand pound microphone for what we're talking about. You just need a you know a good quality uh, microphone for most most musical activities, and that's absolutely fine. Um, but I, I'm afraid I haven't got the I haven't got a kind of um, a, an answer which doesn't involve spending some money. Um, but I, I suppose just equate it to it's almost pretty much the same as, as as buying musical instruments, isn't it? You know, we're all used to buying musical instruments. We know that you pay for what you get. Um, you know, you, unless you're David and can make a brilliant sound on a really cheap trombone for most of us, um, we need to buy a quality instrument to sound good. Um, and that's just the reality of, of life, isn't it? So I think if you are a professional educator, 
um, of the types that we're talking about, then it's not maybe maybe I'll get shot down. But I think it's not unreasonable to expect to have to invest in some decent equipment to do a decent job. Yeah. Um, so just just budget accordingly and and, you know, come and have a chat to me and we'll always help you out with a really good price on whatever it is you want. Thanks, Jonathan. And I think you're right. I think it's that balance of thinking, yeah, what what's what's going to be most useful for me in my work? Um, and and yeah, just getting that that little bit of, of support as to really how to make those decisions and how to make the best investment you can. Yeah. So thank you for that. Ben, do you have anything to add on that question of cost? And yeah, um, I'm just going to declare my hand now. I want to spend as least as I can possibly get away with. And I make no apologies for that because I just hate the kind of being on the treadmill of having to have the latest, you know, thing. Um, so, I mean, for what it's worth, I use a Jabra. Um, I'll just hold it up to the screen. It's a Jabra um, USB plug-in microphone and speaker. I found though when I'm teaching remotely, I can't actually play um, music from my laptop if I'm if I'm demonstrating something for a, a, a pupil. I've got it on my iTunes on my laptop here. For some reason, it doesn't. It just won't work with that particular um, device. And these are just things you find out through experience. Um, so. Um, Certainly speaking to a colleague, Jesper Anderson um, from um, the Royal Danish Academy in Copenhagen. Um, he's very highly experienced in, in distance learning and he and he's he's the head of the Tonmeister course um, in Copenhagen. His view is that, you know, a, a sort of half decent, um, I don't know, let's say 150 pounds um, USB microphone is more than sufficient. And really, there's negligible difference with then going up to the next level above that, you know, to several thousand pounds. He, in his view, and he ought to know, you know, he said, you're not really going to notice a difference. But it is worth, as Jonathan has said, just getting something just a little bit more than just what's built into to your laptop. Um, yeah, I mean, with the whole thing about um, the Lola kit, I mean, having used it on on quite a few occasions now it is absolutely mind-blowing but it's expensive to buy the dedicated um pc i mean it's something though you know the, it's free software the developers in trieste they, they are amazing um i know claudio alocchio one of the developers reasonably well and he just gets back to you just like that i mean it's it's fa you know, fabulous service they will send a, a, a part, you know, a spec list saying this is what you need. But then, you know, so anyone with a little bit of, of computer now who's, you know, doesn't mind having a go at, at building a, a PC themselves could probably put it together. Yeah. I don't know, I'm going to say maybe a thousand pounds or something like that. You do need the specialist camera. Those are coming down in price all the time. The big hindrance just now is that um, it doesn't as of this moment in time work over a standard network so it'd have to be between institutions and again there's the whole problem of getting around the firewall um that well, that that's a whole topic in itself um but yeah so my view is i personally i mean my my uh laptop's pretty much held together with with gaffer tape and things and um yeah and i just want to spend the least amount i possibly can but yeah i think you know, short sentence, decent microphone, that will make a big difference. So over to David. Thank you. Definitely a consensus there on USB mics. Thank you, David. That's very interesting. I think uh, if you look at the way um, other industries have embraced uh, online learning, um, it, it can be, I think, quite inspiring uh, for, for those in the music sector. Um, one, one thing is interesting I found is um, I, I'm doing pilot training at the moment, completely in a midlife crisis moment. And, um, and it's been fascinating how particularly the Americans um, have embraced an online learning platform for people wanting to be pilots. And you think, well, how do you do that? You know, and so what they've done is they've, they, they essentially take you into the cockpit with a student and they are doing a masterclass 
um, with their student in reality, but they're also engaging with the viewer um, in this process. And it's okay, it's not first hand learning, but you, you acquire knowledge and you acquire an understanding and you learn from the other person's mistakes. And when I was at Roland, um, when we were pioneering the, the video technology, we, we worked with a piano teacher in Hawaii uh, on exactly this model. So she was teaching in a classroom um, with nine teachers, nine pupils, uh, and she was dealing with um, you know, their own particular musical technical challenges, but always referring back to the camera because she had thousands of people viewing live from all over the world wanting to uh, to learn and by learning from other people's challenges and mistakes etc so it's a, it's a different kind of teaching learning relationship but i think it's it, it's really valid so uh, so i think in coming back to your question about investing in technology i i think um i i would say you know actually contact manufacturers talk to them about what you're looking for Often, you know, from my experience at Roland, we, we often designed technology in a silo. We had, because of commercial sensitivities, we tended not to do a great deal of market research and we put a product out there and then find how people reacted to it. But, you know, they are desperate to talk to, to users of their products, as Jonathan will probably uh, say, support. And, and so, um, and, and, the more you can demonstrate the potential for these products, the more they will engage with you. And I think that's really valuable. And, and I think my final point would be, you know, what technology, what this technology and what, what, what our experience from COVID has taught us is to think globally, you know, think outside. You know, the, I, I engage with two master's pupils in Hong Kong. And at first I was very suspicious as to whether it would work or not. But now I'm loving it. I meet them every week. Um, for an hour session, they work together. There are a little, there's a little bit of latency, so I'm really interested in Ben's presentation. Um, but it's working, and um, so I, I do say, you know, think globally. This is we're in a different scenario now. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I think think globally and think creatively, as as you've described there. And I think, well, it's been interesting the the journey that that we went on on this project with with Roland Technology. And I always remember Jonathan telling me that the mixers that we were using, you know, and that they were originally designed to actually beam out from um, crematoria where people weren't able, you know, to to come and attend the funeral and. And yet suddenly we're using them to beam out music performances all over the world. And that's not necessarily something that they were initially designed for. And they've worked beautifully for teaching and live streaming. And, and yeah, it's it's we, we're all the more we play around with this technology and play around with the approaches and share our approaches, the better it's going to be. Um, and I, I'm fascinated about your piloting training, David, as well. Um, uh, it reminded me of a, a fact we learned in this morning's presentation, which is that something like we we retain 96% of information when we watch a video compared to about 8% when we read something like a, a massive division in, in how we actually process information. So actually watching somebody learn, you can you can really imagine how that will actually accelerate, accelerate the learning. So thank you. Um, Jonathan, I know you've got a question for Ben, I think. Yeah, question, well, question just um, prefaced by a comment. Um, ben, I was really interested in your presentation. And uh, one of the things you said, which I think you drew on some conversations you'd had with a, a sound artist in New York, and it relates to um, obviously the issue of latency. Um, and I, I'm always kind of, interested and perturbed at the same time that we spend so much time as music educators worried about the latency, digital audio latency on the internet and I know of course that it is important that we learn to play together and I'm not saying that that's not an important musical skill but um, there are inherent limitations in the way that mus musical instruments work um, when we play together in a physical space and we don't worry about those we just learn to live with them and get on with it and I, I'm kind of thinking that then, you know, that we can learn a lot from sound artists and, and, and people who work with technology, you know, more, maybe more frequently than some of us do um, around their performance practices in, in, um, 
in networked musical performances where they don't worry about latency at all. They just they just live with it and get on with it um, and adapt their music in that context. And I think I think, you know, I'd be interested to hear your reflection on that and specifically what you what you kind of feel are the positive affordances that networked audio spaces um, generate for, for musicians. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a fascinating topic. Um, I mean, I'm tempted to say, particularly for me as a percussionist, but I mean, you know, all musicians have to, you know, be able to, well, I say all musicians, I'm going to contradict myself in a minute, but, you know, we have to, it's something we have to do is learn to play in time. And that's the big four tenets of my um, percussion teaching, certainly for drum kit students is, first of all, you've got to have some vocabulary, you know, you got to have something to say on the drum kit and, you know, whether it's a rock or a blues or swing shuffle whatever style the second is you have to play in time you know and that's pretty much you know one of the first things i'll be going on about with with my students third thing is understanding structure and the fourth thing is adding nuances and expression nowhere do i talk about technique um but you know, that's my own teaching philosophy and you know please feel free to disagree with that but anyway those are the big four. And then when I was speaking to Sarah um, earlier this year, I just, you know, she was saying, oh, well, you know, well, in network music, well, you know, there are other sort of ways of measuring time, which are just, you know, part of nature and that. And, you know, and that's what we and it did actually just it kind of it took me a few evenings of reflection just to get my head around it and just think, you know, yeah. <laughs> why not just do diff things differently i mean i'm thinking back to i keep going on about marimbas it's a bit of an obsession of mine but you know playing a marimba say in a in a large church um a massive amount of reverberation there so you know we have to play um slow tempo music otherwise the sound's just going to get completely mashed up and lost and um it's that kind of I'm just I'm really fascinated. I mean, I'm, I, another of my hobbies and it's an expensive hobby is jazz. And so I'm fascinated by the whole call and response thing. And, um, you know, so just thinking about that. Well, you know, there's someone plays a chord, someone plays something in response to it. And I know that um, Raymond McDonald, who may be familiar to some of um, the attendees, um, fantastic musician, and an academic as well based um in glasgow he runs the glasgow improvisers orchestra and they've done a lot of really interesting work over the, the last year or so and again they just kind of go well <laughs> latency just deal with it and just work around it so it certainly caused me to think very differently and just to you know think actually you know there are different ways of doing things and i love that i love being challenged and just you know thinking okay you know the this thing that i really held to for all this time you know i'm now having to rethink it and you know fascinating so that's one of the you know the big sort of things for me but i mean i'm just just open this up to to the floor as it were thinking about you know the future of music education as david's been saying you know, he can he's got students in hong kong so um you know students can now learn with a teacher anywhere in the world where there's an internet connection and providing they've got a credit card too so that's start, that's going to be a massive disruptor to higher education because why would you you know spend thousands um on accommodation and, and all that you know and just going somewhere else to study when you can do it from the comfort of either your own home or your your mum and dad's home and um you know have a part-time job and get you know top quality professional lessons so that's going to be a big disruptor um and then you know staff not having to be physically present um being able to teach you know from from any potentially anywhere in the world one of my dreams is to move to italy and um <laughs> be able to do my school teaching work from somewhere overlooking kind of you know a nice mediterranean sort of beach vista or something like that i don't think it's going to happen realistically but you know i'd love that that would be my dream but you know in in a on a more serious note i think this was something that came up certainly one of the um the presentations i attended from nymaz last year about 
um, with refugee children and maybe having someone to teach them who was maybe you know spoke their language and wasn't physically located in 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 their area so that's really interesting again a great disruptor um, and we can choose to resist it or I think we should, personally I think we should embrace it is that going to put me out of a job I don't know but uh, just one final comment um, just think about you know the possibility to share teaching styles it's a I think of it a bit like the Wizard of Oz and you know you peek behind the curtain and oh <laughs> that's how it works and you know that's a massive thing I think for um certainly in the in the um, data that I analysed from the Swing project um, in Europe, um, the the possibility for one teacher to observe their student learning with a teacher in a different institution and to learn from that because it is quite isolating working alone. I mean I I work for Scottish Borders council music service and um you know i do bump into colleagues but you know not as often as i'd like to i'm just in and out and speaking of which i'm going to be <laughs> i'm going to be logging online in just under 10 minutes to teach at one of my schools but i do yeah i'm now back to teaching mostly in person but to be able to share teaching styles really really interesting so that's just the thought i will just leave hanging there and um yeah over to someone else Great. We've got some some great um, examples of projects and collaborations in the comments as well. So thank you all for those, um, including some examples from Alan Cameron around cloud based technology, which obviously affords other opportunities for online collaboration as well. Does before we let you all go, does anybody else have any more comments? Please do raise your hand or pop something into the Q&A's or chat if any of the delegates have anything else to ask or comment. Nothing's coming up. If any of the panelists, yeah, David, please. Um, well, just really a kind of, I suppose it's a question and an observation, but I, I, I feel that our problem in this country is 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 poor broadband. Mm. Um, you know, which I, I kind of get over the latency bit. I mean, I'm a trombone player. I'm used to latency in an orchestra. You know, um, but I, I um, so I think broadband is a big, big issue here. And certainly where I live in Wiltshire, you know, the, the number of times I drop out, you know, which is not annoying. And the other thing is, and I think this is a question really to both Jonathan and Ben, but certainly from my uh, experience. I think it's um, we we mustn't or shouldn't assume that young people are technologically savvy. I certainly found that you know that this that we, there was a, a while where we called them digital natives. You know, I, I think that's been has been challenged now because. But I certainly feel that with the young people I've worked with, that they're they're not actually that technically savvy. They're less frightened of it, but um, less less skilled. Would you agree? Very quickly, Jonathan. Yeah. Then. Well, Jonathan, you first. Well, I, I think it, it it varies considerably. Um, you know, and f for sure, you know that there are a lot of um, a lot of young people who who are fantastically equipped with a whole range of digital skills and competences, and there and there are many many that that, that would would probably not be as. So I think it's probably as varied as it is with any other part of the population. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely concur with that. Um, some of my students absolutely just don't want to know about it don't want to engage and um and there's this yeah it's definitely a myth that you know oh well old people don't like you know the technology and, and young people lap it up yeah. it's just patently not true i can give you so many examples of you know so-called older people that you know are just really on top of it and um one of my percussion teacher friends and colleagues um you know he's you know, definitely falls into the, um, the older category and he's all over it he's a Roland demonstrator and, and, and that kind of thing so yeah it's patently not true so it does yeah it, it, it varies yeah. well thank you all so much for your um, 
technical competence, pedagogical competence, and for sharing all of your research and insights with us this afternoon. It's been absolutely fascinating, and I'm really, really grateful to all three of you for giving up your time and sharing your expertise with us. Um, and thank you all for joining us as well very much. It's been a really rich discussion. I know we could go on for hours, but we've got another session just about to start, so I'm going to have to very sadly draw it to a close and say thank you and goodbye very much. Thank you very much, even.